Time to put down your fly-catching chopsticks and put on your headband as we wax on and wax off with a retrospective of all aspects of one of my favorite 80s franchises when Johnny Torch reviews the Karate Kid Trilogy. After the success of the Rocky franchise, Hollywood was looking for another sports blockbuster. Thus, Rocky director John G. Avelson eventually had success with another sports drama, The Karate Kid, in 1984. The film included the star-making turn of Ralph Macchio in the title role as Daniel LaRusso. The character's name in the script was originally Daniel Weber, but was changed after Macchio's casting to reflect his ethnicity. The film also reinvented the career of Pat Morita, whom many remember as Arnold from the early seasons of Happy Days. He'd been generally regarded as a comedic actor, doing bit parts on TV shows in the 70s, such as Sanford and Son and The Odd Couple. Morita had to test for the role of Mr. Miyagi five times for producer Jerry Weintraub, as he mistakenly believed Morita didn't have the chops for dramatic acting. But Morita would go on to be nominated for an Academy Award for supporting role of Mr. Miyagi in the film. The movie is also the film debut of Elizabeth Shue as Allie with an Eye. The perfect valley girl, Shue was the object of every 80s teen boy's affections, voting her a girl most worth getting habitually beat up over. She went on to play Jennifer in the Back to the Future sequels, as well as having success in the 80s with Adventures in Babysitting. The film is a fairly straightforward coming-of-age story, where Daniel is transplanted from New Jersey to California when his mother gets a job there. After getting invited to a beach party by a kid named Freddy, who subsequently flakes out on Daniel, he meets Allie and runs afoul of her jealous ex-boyfriend, Johnny Lawrence, consummate bad boy, played by Billy Zabka. Zabka also appeared in the Rodney Dangerfield vehicle Back to School, and Edward Woodward's series The Equalizer. Lawrence is a member of the Cobra Kai, a karate club that is taught by the somewhat deranged John Kreese, played to demented perfection by Martin Cove. Johnny and his band make life miserable for Daniel until Daniel's maintenance man, Mr. Miyagi, steps in. Daniel and Miyagi become fast friends, and Miyagi agrees to teach Daniel karate for self-defense, arranging for him to take place in a karate tournament that would serve as a final showdown. Miyagi's teaching is unorthodox, to say the least, as he instructs Daniel through several steps of menial household maintenance, such as the famous wax-on, wax-off technique. Eventually, Daniel understandably challenges him on this, and Miyagi shows him the method to his supposed madness. Much like the original Rocky, this first Karate Kid film is really the one most treated like a drama, and not as an actioneer. There's a nice scene dedicated to Miyagi where we learn some of his backstory, in that his wife and son tragically died in an internment camp while he was in the war. The studio wanted the scene cut, but Avelson fought for it to remain. Eventually, the tournament occurs, and Daniel wins despite several shady attempts by Cobra Kai to cripple him, beating Lawrence with his finishing move, the crane kick. And to his credit, Johnny takes the defeat like a man, congratulating Daniel on the win. The music was also top-notch, taking another page from the Rocky films. Bill Conti provided the score, which included Zam Fear on the pan flute. Several of the film's songs were also quite good, such as the tournament montage theme, You're the Best, by Joe Esposito. The song was originally composed for Rocky III before Stallone passed on it in favor of Survivor's Eye of the Tiger. Survivor also contributed an enjoyable song, The Moment of Truth, and the film also featured Bananarama's perennial 80s hit, Cruel Summer. Producers had to obtain permission from DC Comics to title the film The Karate Kid as they owned the trademark on a character of the same name from the comic book Legion of Superheroes. The performances are good all around. Machio's Daniel is probably the most rounded here in the trilogy as a character. He comes across temperamental at times, and not like a 24-hour-a-day goody-goody, but he remains an enduring protagonist. A timeless tale with many quotable lines, and star-making turns for many involved. I'm giving The Karate Kid four and a half stars out of five. The Karate Kid Part 2 picks up directly where Part 1 leaves off 
where Daniel has just won the tournament and has a nasty run-in with Chris, who doesn't take Johnny losing all that well, attempting to, well, kill him in the parking lot. Miyagi steps in, humiliating Kreese in the process. The scenes were intended for the closing of the original film, but were cut. Karate Kid Part 2 was always my favorite of the series. It's probably more Miyagi's movie than Daniel's, and the stakes are much higher this time. The fact that I prefer this film to its predecessor has an unfortunate effect of diminishing the first film somewhat, for me at least. When you think of it, apart from Daniel meeting Miyagi and learning some remedial karate skills, the whole first film accomplishes next to nothing. At this point, Ali has run off with a football player six months after Daniel gets his butt kicked six ways to Sunday to be with her. Miyagi's deceased wife and child are never mentioned again, as part of the story revolves around Miyagi rekindling things with his one true love back in Okinawa. Daniel's mother is effectively written out, and of course Daniel still gets bullied about as bad as he did previously, albeit on a different continent. But. Despite effectively undoing about 80% of the previous film's world building, Karate Kid Part 2 is more enjoyable all around. Miyagi gets a letter from his old love who bids him return to Okinawa before his ailing father passes on. Daniel borrows from his college fund to accompany him. There's a nice scene where after Miyagi's father passes, Daniel consoles him by talking about his own father's passing, something we really didn't learn much of in the previous film. Enter the villains of the piece. Miyagi's old best friend turned bitter rival Sato, and his nephew Chosen. Years ago, Miyagi fell in love with Sato's betrothed, Yuki, and made public his intentions to marry her. However, rather than answer Sato's challenge for a fight to the death, Miyagi fled to the States. Interestingly, in the original script for the first film, Miyagi fled to the States to prevent getting conscripted by Japan in World War II. Now having returned, Sato expects Miyagi to fulfill this final fight between them. Sato practically owns all of Okinawa, and when Daniel accidentally exposes Chosen's cheating the village with rigged scales, Chosen begins his own vendetta with Daniel. During all this, Daniel makes time with Yuki's pretty niece and aspiring ballerina, Kumiko, played by Tamalin Tomita. Probably the film's most famous centerpiece, the ice chopping scene, where Chosen confronts Daniel in some GI dive, where people bet on contestants who attempt to chop three blocks of ice with their bare hands. A $600 bet is made between Miyagi and Sato as to whether Daniel can chop through not three, but six blocks of ice. Can he do it? Well, he is the Karate Kid after all. I remember thinking as a kid the film would surely end with a huge fight between Miyagi and Sato. And yet, while the film admittedly looks like it's going there for a while, a hurricane-level storm makes all the difference. Miyagi saves Sato's life, breaking a large beam that pins him down. The two reconcile, but Chosen is unwilling to mend his feud with Daniel and aid his rescue of a little girl from the storm, leading Sato to disown him. Sato allows the town to hold their festival in an old castle at Daniel's urging. And as a kid, I remember actually thinking the story was over at that point. But Chosen returns and threatens Kumiko, provoking Daniel into a life-and-death battle. It's kind of ironic that despite Rocky V failing to please with an actual street fight, Karate Kid 2's bloody and brutal brawl is the most satisfying of the franchise. It's nice to see Daniel actually holding his own for the most part, and it's interesting to see his crane attack being virtually useless against Chosen after being hyped in the first film that, if executed correctly, no can defense. As the battle draws to a close, Daniel puts his new power-up into action. The secret to Miyagi family karate, the drum technique, which Daniel uses to defeat Chosen. The soundtrack was a favorite of mine as a kid, and I played it endlessly. The Oscar-nominated Glory of Love theme by Peter Cetera started a lifelong fandom for me with Chicago, though, sadly, that song was Peter's first hit after leaving Chicago permanently. The Moody Blues rocker Rock and Roll Over You was still a big favorite. Fish for Life by Man Crab and Carly Simon's love theme, Two Looking at One, were also played pretty consistently. The film did even better at the box office than its predecessor, which naturally spawned a slew of merchandise including a video game for Nintendo that I enjoyed quite a bit, where players reenacted the tournament fight from the first film and a significant portion of the events of the second film. I also collected the set of action figures and play sets that were released at the time. The action figures were decently sculpted for its time, and at least somewhat resembled the cast. The figures all came with removable cloth G-tops, and a break-apart prop which in most cases were based on the movies, such as Daniel coming with a block of ice to chop. The figures released from the first film were Daniel in white, and Miyagi in gray, Johnny in crease, 
in Cobra Kai Black. For the second film, Daniel in Red, Chosen in Gold, and Sato in Black. And a final wave with Daniel in Gold, Miyagi in Purple, Sato in Orange, Johnny in Teal, Kreese in Gray, and Chosen in Beige. This final set included weapons such as Chosen with a built-in knife to threaten Kumiko with, if they actually had a Kumiko figure. Something you probably couldn't get away with in these PC times. The figures were reasonably durable, though some of them suffered broken springs from repeated usage of the tri-action levers. My white G Daniel ended his career with a permanently raised leg. Johnny must have swept it one too many times. There was a tournament setting with a mat designed to look like the one used in the movies with a cheap cardboard backdrop of the audience, which, per habit, I promptly lost. And it came with the referee action figure Pat E. Johnson, who appeared in all the films and coincidentally was the film's karate choreographer. Sato's cannery, where Daniel could practice his drum technique, and the attack alley and training center, which was basically a dojo with plastic ninja figures and breakaway pieces. Sadly, the popularity was not to last, so there was no barns and silver action figures to add to the festivities. But when looking for new challenges for Daniel, I remember getting some of the knockoff action figures out in that time. I also remember getting the drum thingy that Miyagi gives to Daniel, and I remember us as kids always reenacting the liver die honk routine that bookends the film. I watched this one all the time as a kid, and it remains a firmly cherished favorite to this day. I'm giving Karate Kid Part 2 5 stars out of 5. For the Karate Kid Part 3, screenwriter and creator of the Karate Kid films, Robert Mark Kamen, said in an interview at the time that he was eager to have the film written around the concept of Daniel falling to the dark side. And while this film is undoubtedly the weakest of the trilogy, it is an interesting concept. Once again, the film picks up shortly after the second film ends, as Daniel and Miyagi return from Okinawa. John Kreese is taking off for Tahiti. The real-world reason probably being Martin Cove was only available a certain number of shooting days, as he was still appearing in the series Cagney and Lacey at the time. Kreese, having lost all his students, presumably after trying to kill Johnny in the parking lot, closes the Cobra Kai dojo and returns to his old army buddy and founder of the Cobra Kai, Terry Silver played with manic zest by real-life black belter Thomas Ian Griffin, who promises to help Kreese get revenge and reopen the Cobra Kai. Meanwhile, Daniel and Miyagi return to find Daniel's apartment and subsequently Miyagi's job demolished by the new owner. Daniel's mom is conveniently written out again as she returned to Jersey while Daniel was in Okinawa to take care of a sick uncle. At least this time they were decent enough to give Randy Heller a cameo. Daniel decides to forego his college tuition, again, this time in favor of opening a bonsai tree shop with Mr. Miyagi, who, hearkening back to the first film, as this movie frequently does, has such a skill for bonsai cultivation. Enter the film's new leading lady, Jessica, played by Robin Lively. It's explained that Kumiko went to Tokyo to begin her ballet career, despite being told in the last film there were no schools for it in Okinawa. So Daniel takes up with Jessica. I've always found it a little off-putting that Daniel was given the James Bond treatment with the ladies, given that the first film centered so strongly around Allie. In this film, Jessica tells Daniel up front that she intends to move back to Ohio and rekindle things with her old boyfriend, which puts any chance for romance on ice, and consequently makes Jessica a somewhat thankless role. In the meantime, Silver recruits bad boy Mike Barnes to challenge Daniel for his karate title. While Daniel is originally interested in defending his title, Miyagi sees it as a betrayal of what his karate is all about. Using karate to defend life and honor is one thing. Using it to defend plastic trophies would cheapen it. Daniel eventually agrees. However, Barnes is persistent. Like a combination of Johnny Lawrence and Clever Lang, he continually goads and attacks Daniel and wrecks their bonsai shop. Eventually, Barnes forces Daniel to sign his rematch application when Daniel tries to rescue Miyagi's last bonsai tree hidden down a deep ravine. Silver ingratiates himself with Daniel by claiming that Kreese has died after his disgrace. After framing a clash with Barnes, Silver offers to train Daniel as the new leader of Cobra Kai. Now this is pretty much where the film loses me. Miyagi refuses to train Daniel for the tournament, but basically Daniel is in the same position he found himself in the first film, being habitually bullied and attacked until he meets his tormentor in the tournament. So why is he so adamant in not training Daniel now? 
Daniel takes up Silver's offer to train him as a member of Cobra Kai, and this would actually be a pretty amusing concept had Daniel not seemed to lose all common sense here. Silver makes him train on hardwood dummies, which causes him to routinely injure himself. Hey Daniel, if Silver told you to jump off a bridge... Miyagi and Daniel's relationship becomes strained, and it's actually pretty emotional seeing how it affects Miyagi. But as I said, it's pretty much in Miyagi's power to step in and give Daniel guidance, now that he arguably needs it the most. And for Daniel's part, you kind of feel for him as he seems increasingly lost and out of sorts when it seems the simplest solution would be for them to get together and work things out. Eventually, Silver sets up someone to hit on Jessica to get Daniel's killer instinct to emerge. After breaking the guy's nose, Daniel comes to his senses and realizes he lived long enough to see himself become the villain. Again, this feels like a worthy concept, but seems somewhat rushed and half-hearted. Daniel decides to break things off with Silver, but gets ambushed by Silver, Kreese, and Barnes in the Cobra Kai dojo. Miyagi comes to his aid and then agrees to train Daniel, something he could have done when Daniel was being assaulted in the first place, but... Rather than learn a new finishing move like the first two films, Miyagi continues to teach Daniel the kata they had been practicing, which is sort of a series of systematic positions, and not really an attack. In the tournament, Daniel faces Barnes, and much like I said earlier, Barnes sort of evokes a valley-style clubber Lang from Rocky III, where he taunts Daniel mercilessly and punishes him throughout the match rather than just get the simple win. Much like Rocky against Lang, Daniel also admits he doesn't think he can win because he's afraid of Barnes. After Miyagi's encouragement, Daniel practices the kata, which he uses to confound Barnes long enough to deliver the winning blow. Unlike the previous films, this film didn't have a mind-blowing soundtrack, with the exception of a decent offering by veteran 70s group Little River Band's Listen to Your Heart. At least they didn't follow suit with other film soundtracks of the day like Ghostbusters 2 and Rocky 5, and load the soundtrack with a lot of hip-hop, which was the current craze at the time. But it makes sense given that this film is supposedly taking place about six months after the last film, and a year after the first film, dating this film at about 1985 so naturally they kept a fairly generic 80s soundtrack. In the end, the film comes across as a bit of a half-hearted attempt. On the one hand, they seem to be trying to appeal to the juvenile karate craze of the period, where kids were going nuts over Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and soon-to-be Power Rangers, while at the same time trying a bit too much to seem hard-edged, which makes it difficult to see which audience this was intended for. It didn't help, of course, that the film came out in 1989, the first big juggernaut summer that had Batman and Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade to compete with. Despite a somewhat interesting premise, the film fails to reach its potential. The characters of Daniel and Miyagi seem like pale imitations of their former selves, despite solid performances by Machio and Morita. Its saving grace may be the over-the-top villains who pretty much have good entertainment value. I'm giving The Karate Kid Part 3... Three and a half stars out of five. Shortly after part three, NBC debuted a Karate Kid animated series. Neither Machio nor Marita voiced their respective characters, but the animation was reasonably good. It didn't last long, I scarcely remember it, as it had only 13 episodes. The series revolved around the globe-trotting Miyagi and Daniel, and an Okinawan girl named Takai. I guess Kumiko was still busy with ballet. As they tried to find a magical shrine, between Karate Kid Part 3's failure at the box office and the death of the action figures after Part 2, the animated series failed to find a following and signaled the end of the franchise. True, they tried to revive it with an up-and-coming Hilary Swank for the next Karate Kid with Pat Morita once again reprising the role of Miyagi, but I saw it once and found it largely forgettable. The series was for all intents rebooted in 2010 with Jackie Chan and Jaden Smith, but in all honesty, who cares? Finally, it's been announced that YouTube Red have gotten the rights to produce a sequel series titled Cobra Kai, which would reunite Ralph Macchio and Billy Zabka with their roles of Daniel LaRusso and Johnny Lawrence, respectively. On the surface, this could be very enjoyable. Seeing the return of Zabka and viewing the show through the eyes of Johnny Lawrence as he attempts to relaunch the Cobra Kai seems a fresh and new slant on the story. My fear, however, is that the show is being described as a comedy. While the original films have their share of light-hearted moments, I wouldn't exactly call the films comedies. 
There's been a fairly popular running joke in recent years that claims that Daniel is the actual antagonist of the first film, and that Johnny was merely an innocent victim that got a raw deal. Of course, it's an amusing joke, but I can't see finally reuniting the cast after all this time, merely for a popular internet joke. It'll be interesting to see if any familiar faces appear, such as Martin Cove's John Kreese, who routinely makes the convention circuit with Machio and Zabka, or the more elusive Elizabeth Shue as Allie. The little info released at this point does point to the death of Mr. Miyagi having a profound impact on Daniel's life. So, that at least sounds promising. Whether the new sequel series is widely accepted or not, The Karate Kid will remain a treasured part of the 80s fondly remembered. Until next we meet, this is Johnny Torch reminding you, Bonsai! And I'll be with you again real soon.